I think this ex vivo concept is much of the same thing where we will either create a scaffold, a structure for the cells to grow on, and then we need to be able to nurture those cells and protect them as they're growing and forming a lung or part of a lung. So that's uh, another step. And then the third step will be really, and I think the ultimate is, is we should be able to treat the lung inside the patient when um, it stops to work or when disease occurs. And, and this is really where regenerative medicine sits right in the middle because when your lung is injured, it should respond by healing itself. And that happens to all of us. You get a bad viral infection or you get a pneumonia, your lung recovers and you're back to normal. In some patients, you get an injury where the lung doesn't get back to normal and heals with scar tissue. Why does that happen? That's a failure of regeneration. So if we can understand how to build a new lung, how does a lung that's injured repair itself the right way versus the wrong way, then we can start to look at preventing the disease and preventing the need for a transplant. And just as an aside, cancer is regenerative medicine gone the wrong way, where a cell that should have turned off and not be doing anything grows out of control and forms a tumor. So I think those are the uh, aspects of where this is really pushing the future of, of, of medicine and science. Do we have a question? Yes. Um, you know, w when, when lung transplantation started out, uh, we really were, it was a highly dangerous and challenging procedure, and we really were transplanting people who had failed lungs but otherwise were tremendously healthy, like they only had one problem. And that has been the philosophy for, you know, over a decade and a half. And then we started to expand the indications to say, you know, can we can we push it and so on. And really, it still is a, a tough operation for a patient to go through. And, and certainly, our data shows that if you're over 60 years old, the outcomes are, are a little bit less good. So uh, what we do is we assess the patient based on their ability to go through that operation. And we've transplanted people at the age of 70 now uh, and who are fit enough to be able to go through the operation. So we don't have a specific age cutoff. It's really, do we have a reasonable chance that we can pull you through that operation? Okay. Right. Um, really, the, the donor money isn't really kicking in for the patient care stuff. It's really for the innovation and the research. And, and we're an example in this ex vivo thing. That little pump system I showed you cost $100,000. Every experiment, that tubing we use is clinical grade tubing. Uh, and, and that means it's the same type of bypass tubing that we use in the operating room when we do surgery so that it's clean, it has no pathogens on it, it's good enough to put in a patient. Because one of the things we realized is that we were shooting ourselves in the foot. Usually in the lab, you're sort of scrimping and trying to use equipment that's old or given up from the clinical area or reuse equipment. And tubing that we clean and reuse has all the inflammatory mediators, turns on all the cells and da damages the lung. It's no wonder we were never able to do it. So one of the key things was to have enough money to say, we're going to use a new circuit on every experiment so that we make the perfect situation where we're not adding injury to the lung. 
And that was the key finding in that 2008 paper, that we can take a normal lung and put it through the system and not injure it. Nobody had done that before. Every other curve you'd see gradual deterioration over time. So it was the ability to have the money to say, we're going to do this experiment right. We don't have the data we, to, to be able to write a grant and say we, we can do it this way. And then also when we apply to the CIHR, you know, you apply for a $200,000 grant and they congratulate you for being the top 10% in the country and they give you $129,000 to do the work that you budgeted $200,000 for. So it fills that gap and it, it, it allows us to just say, you've got the opportunity and do it. And, and I think from the other side of the coin is the deliverable. I'd like to be able to show you where your money made a difference and it's, it's this way. And, and also the industry partners, they, we, you know, they, they've been coming up to the plate too. Astellas, Vitrolize, so on, have been giving us money to develop this to, to increase transplantation. I think that should be the last question. Mm -hmm. So the um, first question was um, land, do we, but what about land, do we do transplants for it? Yes, we, we've done a number of transplants for patients with, with lymphangial myomatosis or land, uh, and, and uh, we have been very successful with that. So occasionally people with land need a transplant and it can be done. It's a little bit more difficult for a few reasons, but certainly doable. Um, I'm not sure about bowel transplants for Crohn's disease, but um, certainly Crohn's disease is one of the conditions where uh, you end up having to remove sections of bowel again and again until you don't have enough left. And so that, that is the problem uh, in terms of the disease. And, and certainly our team, uh, Dr. David Grant and Dr. Sassman and so on, are doing small bowel transplants. Small bowel transplants are quite challenging. The bowel has some problems because it has a lot of lymphoid tissue in, in, the, in the graft. And so you get actually graft with both, uh, where the graft attacks the recipient. And, and it's a complicated process from that point of view, but it has been done. 